let's get going. Man, I can't, in, I can't imagine all you naked because I can't even see you with this lighting. That may be a good thing, I don't know, we'll see. Oh, thank you. So I am gonna talk about the tenets of going at DevOps speed, DevSecOps speed, I guess. Let's be proper here. Do I have this thing turned on? Now I do. Look at that, it works. So who am I? I'm Matt Tassaro, as he said. Um, I've been doing this DevOps thing for a long time. I've been involved in OWASP. I'm currently on the board of the Global Board of Directors for OWASP. I do the OWASP podcast. Um, I'm a maintainer in Defect Dojo, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, just so you know my biases, this is a Linux laptop. I'm a Linux guy. I've been using free and open source software forever. Yes, I know when my kids went to college, I'm such that dad that I was like, yes, I will buy you a laptop, but it has to be from System76. So both of my kids are running Linux in college and doing fine. Um, and then I have a, a second degree black belt in home sudo. Um, that was me. I could not believe I got this body up to break two boards at once to get my second degree black belt. I don't think I can do that today because I haven't been to the dojang in a while. But yeah, no, that was amazing. That also scared the out of me <laughs> when I knew I had to do that. But I, I lived through it, so that's good. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to do a quick overview just to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. I've got what I'm calling two fundamental truths. I guess I've been doing this long enough. I can like make up stuff. So I'm doing the two fundamental truths and the four what's, and then we'll do a conclusion. So let's start at the beginning and do a quick overview. So my goal here is to have you turn chaos into calm and distress into success. That's what I'm trying to do with this talk. And let's see how close I get to that goal. So what's the background for this talk? I wanted to, well, the, when I created this talk, what I wanted to do is sort of distill the things that I've learned over my time is doing various and sundry AppSec things as if I'm talking to somebody who just got dropped in to do product security or AppSec or DevSecOps or whatever you want to call the thing. Everybody likes to call it something different, right? And you've been told you need to do AppSec, right? Just kind of like that one Supreme Court judge who said, I know pornography when I see it. It's probably that vaguely defined for you. Um, which is usually the case. Um, you have a limited team and budget. It says, I'm not gonna give you like spend four gazillion dollars and hire 800 people and all your problems are solved. And what I'm really trying to give you is a simple system that adapts to complex situations. I mean, you heard it in the keynote yesterday. There's a lot of complexity here. Heard it in several talks. AppSec is hard. We heard it from Manico. This stuff is tricky. So there are complex situations you have to deal with, but if you can deal with them with a simple system, I think you can go really far. So I'm gonna, once again, my six things of DevOps, the two fundamental truths and the four what's. I'm gonna take a slight diversion and I wanna talk about simple machines because I don't remember even when I learned about this but I was just fascinated by this idea that there are these several very simple things that you can make that you can then combine to make very complex machines. They're sort of like the Lego blocks of mechanical engineering. Right, so you have things like an inclined plane or a wedge, or a lever, or a pulley. These are very simple tools. They've been around forever and a day, and we're doing interesting things by combining them to then make complex things. For example, if you have an inclined plane and a wheel and axle, and suddenly you have Archimedes screw, right? Which is a thing you can crank, and they, they'd use it like in Egypt to raise water out of rivers up into fields, right? Simple machine that's just combining, or a complex machine, rather, that's combining two simple machines to produce something useful. And I want to kind of do that for DevSecOps, at least in this talk. So I'm going to define some simple machines for DevSecOps and change my title slightly to six simple machines of DevSecOps. But I didn't want to lead with it. I wanted to hold it off. So let's talk about the two fundamental truths. These are the two things you absolutely have to do um, regardless, right? And all the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk about really depend on these two things being sorted out to some degree. They're never gonna be sorted out perfectly, but they do need to be sorted out to some level. So first one is what I'm calling the ground truth. This is know where you're starting from, right? You just got hired into this product security thing or you just got transferred or whatever, and you now own this space. You need to understand what it is you've just inherited, right? Let's understand what the ground truth is. What have I got dropped into? I would highly recommend doing an initial assessment. And, and why? Well, the one thing you want to do if you are hired or given a job to do is be able to demonstrate progress. 
And without measurement, you can't really do a diff and show progress. So it's just kind of fundamental that you need to get that. It also gives you a lot of intel into what it's going to be like to finish the rest of whatever your job is right at this place that you're now doing AppSec. So it's really crucially important. And obviously, you have to, I would measure as early as possible because you can't do a diff unless you have two things. <laughs> so if you wait six weeks to do the initial assessment, you've got to wait another chunk of time before you can even show progress. So I would get in there and do that right away. Um, and it, it, this is something where you can get caught up on the accuracy of it. I wouldn't kill yourself on that. Like this is paper napkin math can be fine. So what are you going to find in that initial assessment? I found everything from perfect green field, which is a rarity that is nice, to scorched earth, like absolute chaos. There was one place where there was eight large divisions of a very large company that could combine into a center of excellence, um, which is like how you combine stuff to make chaos. right? And then we were supposed to do AppSec for this big, suddenly glued together thing. And it was, it was pretty interesting, let me put it that way. Um, And the, the range of things you'll have if you're doing AppSec is I've had everything from, we have no idea, we know we have a bunch of developers in there in three different continents, so would you please go find us a list of apps, which is you have no idea what you have, to I worked at one place that had a concrete list of every COTS and custom-made application that was being run at that business. That was the one and only one I've ever heard of, so I wouldn't expect that. But if you get it, you're bloody lucky. That's really fantastic. Or maybe, like, I'd love this one, <laughs> this one time I did a talk and I was like, who knows a list of all of your software? And I had somebody in the audience raise their hand. I'm like, okay, I gotta ask, what, what is it? And he's like, we are work for a SaaS company and we only have one piece of software. And I was like, okay, well, you're the exception, right? You may get there, but I kind of doubt it. Um, the other thing that's interesting, even about SaaS companies, is product, right? We have a product, we sell three products. There is product, from the marketing team, there's product from the CEO team, there's product from the development teams, and none of those definitions are generally the same. Right? So it gets really interesting. A lot of security tools think of products as a repo. Well, that's probably not what the CEO thinks of as a product. And then when you add microservices or um, like mobile, right? Uh, there was one place I worked where we had a product that had an Android app, a mobile app, a desktop app, and a web app. That's a product. Well, that's four fairly substantial pieces of code that made up a product. So all this ranting about product is really to tell you, you gotta figure out what is a product. What is the product in the context of where you got dropped in? That's crucially important, right? Um, and whatever, establish, whatever definition you establish, you need to stick to it. I have a, a kind of a joking bullet point of like make a poster out of it, but you do need to kind of like settle on something and stick to your guns as best you can because shifting definitions of what a product is also shifts your metrics, makes your assessments not so great. It just causes problems. And this is something that I have done in the past, or haven't done in the past early, and it made my future life not so great. As you have questions like, did you assess product X? Right? It's very you know, often a VP or some such person will come to you and go, hey, did you assess product X? We heard there's these people attacking things like this and our thing kind of looks like it, what are we gonna do? If you don't know what product X is, how do you even answer that question? Well, I scanned two of the four repos that make up product X last week. Does that mean I know the state of product X? I probably don't. So you really have to sort of nail this down. It seems like a kind of a stupid pedantic thing, but it is vitally important. And then understand the scope of your work. What have you been asked to do, right? Um, Usually, like I said, it's do AppSec. Um, and it's, sometimes I've been in places where it has been no more formally defined than that. I've worked at places that doing AppSec meant anything that went over 80 or 443. No infrastructure at all. Literally webby things. <laughs> and I've worked at other places where everything that ran a product from the iron up was my problem. So there's not a standard here when you're doing AppSec or DevSecOps or whatever. It may be cloud, it could be containers, it could be Kubernetes, Kubernetes could be another team's thing, so it's really not your problem. You gotta figure that out, right? You gotta understand the scope of your work and where the lines are. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is the vulnerability life cycle, right? You're gonna run tools or do manual testing, you're gonna find things, 
some of those things are going to get fixed, and you're going to, someone is going to walk that from, gee, this thing is bad, to gee, this thing is fixed. You need to know where your lines and where your stop and start are. I've worked at places where I owned all of it, from when I found it to when it got retested and validated and we, we said it was good. I've worked at other places where I find it and I hand it off to another team and they go wrestle the developers to get it fixed. So you don't know, like these aren't standard. Um, oh, and then the final thing, who are your upstream and downstream stakeholders? Right? Who are the people who can potentially put work on your plate and who are the people that need, you need to show the outputs of your work to? Those are two crucial things. And this, actually the keynote yesterday talked a lot about this side of it, like how do you explain to the people who a lot of times are the budget makers that what you're doing is valuable and you're moving the needle, right? You need to understand who those people are. And like was said yesterday at the keynote, you need to understand how to talk to them. Oh, so how do you get this done? Particularly the initial assessment. Um, I would decide how much time you want to spend. I try to keep this pretty short and limited initially just because I don't want to burn a lot of cycles trying to understand where I've landed before I even do any work because it doesn't look like doing work to a lot of people. Um, you'll need a com the two competing forces of accuracy and speed. Right? I want to get this done yesterday, but the quicker I do it, the less accurate it's likely to be. So, but I could do it super accurately, but that's like a six month project because I got to talk to 27 developers and different business units and yada yada. So you're gonna have to make a choice there. Um, iterative is really important, right? This initial assessment is probably gonna be pretty sus. Six months in when you look back at it and go, God, I didn't know about half of the junk that I should have talked to. That's okay. Like these things are gonna iterate. You're gonna have to iterate with these, with the situation. And then decide if this is gonna be a collaborative assessment where you're gonna reach out to other teams and bring in their input or do it solo. And those have time and accuracy constraints as well. Right, there's a lot of angles to this. Things I like to use, OWASP SAM is a great thing. Um, ASVS, the Application Security Verification Standard is a great thing. And DSOM, if you're not familiar with that, the DevSecOps Maturity Model. All of those are great things. I've never used them verbatim, or verbatim rather. Um, I've used them to inspire me to know what questions to ask. Because those are general documents that generally answer this question. You're in a specific case you need to modify it to fit your specific case. Okay, oh, let me push this magic button so I can see how much time I've taken. There we go. So second one, the source of truth, single source of truth. This is another fundamental thing that you need. You need to understand, like have a, as I call it, a canonical representation of reality. Like what is the stuff that I know for sure um, and how do I know that and where do I keep it? This is the single source of truth. Because if you buy five different vendors, you will have five different web sites you get to log into and get the sliver of the truth, but you want all of it. Although lots of vendors will tell you they do all the things. And of course they do all the things perfectly because that's what vendors do. Right, it's just obvious. Oh yeah, you, you were started out as a SCA company and now you do 12 other things, therefore you must be good at those 12 other things you just bought random startups that did them to fill a bullet list, but it's all good. Anyway, I digress. So, canonical representation of reality, right? You, you won't have the big picture by definition when you walk into this place, um, or any place. Even if that one place where I had the actual list of apps, that just means I know what I have to test. I don't know if they're important. I don't know if they're being deprecated. I don't know anything, right? Um, you need something that will adapt and grow as time because you are gonna flip over rocks and find new things. Like, that is just the nature of the beast. Um, there'll be whole business units that either get closed or get bought that you were going to inherit or disinherit, right, as time goes on. So this thing has to be flexible. I already said about the 27 web consoles. And when you're picking one, you need something that can hold the data you need flexibly because if you've ever used more than one security tool, guess what? Every vendor has their own very unique view of the universe that's rather snowflakey, and you have to adjust for that. You need to filter, sort, and otherwise manipulate the data because you're gonna have different stakeholders that care about different things. Um, I already said the different views. Oh, and then deduping and false positive, grouping findings, right? If I have six TLS issues from an infrastructure scan, let's really tell one team to turn, tune up TLS. It's not six things they have to fix. So don't report six, report one. Those kind of things are really important. 
So I know what you're thinking. 90% of enterprise vulnerability managements are using this tool. Any guesses? Yeah. There's enterprise vulnerability management for you. Oh, baby. That's the one. And this is sadly true at more places than I care to, to tell you about. And all I have to say is that makes as much sense as me putting rain boots on my dog. Like, absolutely no sense. I have that same look when I see it. I'm like, why are you using Excel? There are better things. I would suggest Defect Dojo, right? I'm a maintainer of it. This is probably not too much of a surprise, but it was created for this very situation. There's a couple versions of it. There's OWASP Defect Dojo, which is the open source one. You can go to GitHub right now, download it, and start playing around with it. That's perfectly cool. There's also Defect Dojo Pro, which is a SaaS offering that we just started offering, which is awesome, because now we have funding for our project, which is pretty cool. Um, Pro does have a dark mode, which people seem to be very excited about, by the way. Um, and we are currently beta testing a new UI that also has a dark mode that is very exciting. Um, so wh wh why Defect Dojo is a single source of truth? It'll manage a, almost, well, it will manage all of your DevSecOps program, honestly. It does inventory, it does product tracking, it, you can do typing of the products. Um, it has the ability to sort and filter in a number of different ways uh, for the vulnerabilities that are stored inside of it. It'll dedupe, it'll do false positive, it'll do engagement tracking, it has custom report generation. If you're doing, this is one of the, Defect Dojo is an interesting tool, and it's an interesting problem to solve. Because I said I want a simple thing to solve complex problems, but usually the, the way you solve complex problems are with complex things. If anyone's ever like tried to admin Jira that has 4,000 settings and ability to mash stuff around, well, how do you get around that? Like, I don't want to be prescriptive in this tool, but I also don't want to give you an inflexible model. So tagging is one of the ways that Defect Dojo really makes that awesome. You can do tons of tagging and a bunch of things like that. And one of the things that came out of this that I didn't even realize when we first made it was, having historical knowledge of past assessments is hugely important, right? Inevitably, a VP is gonna come by and go, oh my God, when was the last time we looked at product X? Well, if I have this, I just log in and go, oh, September the 7th, a year ago, or whatever. Very handy. So why did we create Defect Dojo originally? I was working at Rackspace. I was running the product security team. We had everything under the sun and all the different tools to run them. We were doing loads of manual testing and we were just tired of dealing with these snowflakey different tools and trying to get results out to teams in a sane fashion. That's really what drove it. That and, and the ability to do automation. There's a very uh, robust REST API, sorry Jim, um, <laughs> on top of Defect Dojo. It's a very active project with a large community. Um, we do monthly releases, so the, we do Semver, so the minor version we do once a month, and then bug fixes every week between those minor versions. So we're revving very quickly. And I can't remember, what are we up to? I took these screenshots the other day. Uh, 3.1 thousand stars. I remember when Greg and I were like, we got to 100 stars. That was a while ago, but that was cool. And then if you want commercial support, obviously Defect Dojo Inc. will get you there. And if you want more information, because I'm going to just, that's all I'm going to say about it, there's an hour-long video that I did with We Hack Purple. If you Google Purple in Defect Dojo, it's the top hit. If you want to hear me talk for another hour, I don't know why you would, but you can watch that. Okay, the four what's. We talked about the two truths, the ground truth and the single source of truth. What about the four what's? So I want to start with the big picture and kind of like Jim earlier, I just like this image. It seemed ridiculous that somebody is throwing up something when they're wearing VR goggles. I'm guessing maybe they got scared and threw it up. But I was like, why are they throwing things in the air with VR goggles? They can't even freaking see it. Like, I don't get it, but let's talk about the big picture. So simple thing for complex situations. This is Chipotle, right? You can go there and you can get food from Chipotle but you can get it with chicken or with the pork or, or beef. You want red beans or black beans or, but as the workers there, I have a limited selection of choices to provide you with something that fits your custom needs. And that's the idea behind these four what's. And so if you've ever heard me talk before, you've seen this image. It's what I call the AppSec pipeline. 
And this is fundamentally what happens at any AppSec program I've ever dealt with. You have some sort of intake, things come into your life. These could be things that are programmatic, I'm running CICD. These could be things that are on a calendar because every quarter we need to do some kind of compliance scanning, whatever it is. You have intake. Triage, okay, work has landed on my plate. How much love, care, and feeding am I gonna give that work? Because guess what, I have a limited team. I can't do all the things to all the apps all the time because reality. So I've got to triage it. The next I'm doing some sort of testing based on that triage. And then finally the delivery section which is where I've taken the output of what I've done in terms of testing and I'm handing it to those downstream stakeholders to give them an idea of what value they're getting out of me and my team generally um, for AppSec. And of course, Defect Dojo fits right there as a vulnerability manager. That's what it was made for. Honestly, that was the, the reason we built it. So let's talk about the four what's. Intake, right, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's the work that comes in, what do you have to do with it, right? The triage, how many resources are you gonna use to fulfill the goal of that work that came into your life? Testing, what's the current security state of the thing that I'm testing, my testing target? And then delivery, what do I need to do to address the needs of the downstream stakeholders, right? These can be radically different things. Um, perfect example of downstream stakeholders that just popped into my head, so I'm gonna say it. Um, there was a, it was working at a place where the DBAs were very annoyed about the data quality of the data they were getting into their databases. I heard about this. I leveraged that to say, hey, why don't we make a standard set of regexes for all of our common data? Right? DBAs get happy, and I sold it to the DBAs as you get good quality data. Then I went to the PMs and I said, hey, your guys are writing all this validation code. Why don't we make a standard library? Now I was fortunate, we only wrote in two languages, so we only had to implement this thing twice. But we, like, why don't we write a standard library and then if your teams use these standard libraries, the DBAs are happy, I don't have vulnerabilities. Now granted, input validation isn't perfect, but it was certainly better than what we were doing. So like, hey, we all win. And I sold that to different people in different ways. That's what I mean by figuring out what those downstream stakeholders need. So let's talk about intake, right? Work comes in, what do you need to do with it? So you have an initial assessment, right? You know what your scope is. That's gonna determine what you do with intake. You're gonna get asked to do things that aren't in your scope. And if you are successful, people are gonna try to get you to do things that aren't in your scope because they know the other team probably won't deliver. Like that's just a fact of life. Um, when you are gathering information to do testing, I wanna, I'm gonna cheat and use a coding practice called dry. Um, don't repeat yourself. In this case, what I mean by don't repeat yourself is don't ask for the same data all the time. If you're interacting like doing a quarterly scan of some chunk of infrastructure, the second time you do that, it shouldn't be here's this empty form, fill it out, let me go test it. It should be last time you told me these things, tell me if they're the same or not, and I move on from there, right? That way at least you're buying some goodwill with the people you're testing. Um, so there's different ways that events are gonna come in, right? Or uh, work is gonna come in. It could be event-based. We just had a new release. There was a, a bloody news article about something and now the CISO is, is freaked out. It could be calendar, right? Every month, like I said, every quarter we do PCI scanning or some such thing. And then there's gonna be ad hoc and plan. Right? Those are kind of the two big categories when you think about it. I initially tried to limit intake. This is mostly a preservation of me and my team because there's only a bunch of water that can get through that pipe. But this is politically very tricky, right? Saying no to people never goes well. Um, this is where having some executive buy-in to when you define what your scope is is really important. Um, if you have automated intake, this can really help. And what I mean by automated intake, that can be something as a place where people fill out a form and put in a ticket or something like that. It could also be things like automated jobs. I've done things where I know that our standard pen test requires, I don't know, I'm picking numbers because I don't remember, say 28 things that we do in our standard manual pen test. I have daily things that run that do 15 of those checks. Well, I just took a whole load off my plate that's already pre-calculated by the time I'm doing a manual test. Those are the kind of things that can really help bump up your throughput. 
Um, yeah, so all that. So triage. Okay, so you've accepted this work. You need to understand how much effort, how much love, how much care and feeding is worth putting into getting that goal. All right, you have a goal for this, right? That's kind of important. Like you are testing this because of reason, and you should know what that reason is. Um, what I'd like to do is to bucket the level of testing. Uh, I've usually done three, it can be more. I don't know why three just feels right to me. Um, and I look at things like how critical are those to the business, how much money do they bring in, how much, honestly, sometimes political capital they have, because some people have babies that maybe aren't that important to the business, but they are important to the business, wink, wink. Um, if you have automation in place to be able to test these things, that to me can raise them up from say a low effort to a higher effort because the, suddenly the actual effort that my team is doing is less. And then the accuracy of the tool. Right? If I have a tool and the only tool I, I, the tool I inherited is horribly inaccurate and I don't want to pass on non-actionable findings downstream, running that thing is expensive, right? So there are all those kind of cost considerations in terms of team bandwidth you have to think about. I already talked about pre-calculating, right? This is where you can do some work ahead of time or do it continually and have it sort of cached and ready to go. And you want to keep those buckets like really straightforward and simple. If you meet these five things, you fall into this bucket. If you don't meet those five things, then you're in the second bucket, unless you have this third case that you're near the third bucket. It has to be very concrete. You don't want arguing about like, I think this is really a 2.5, not a two, right? No, I need a, the, the whole, uh, oh shoot, what is that? Oh, dang it, the, the uh, Fibonacci sequences, right? They're like, doo -doo -doo, how do you sprinting, sprint points, right? You have very concrete numbers with gaps. So you don't have silly arguments about, well, I think it's a four. Well, I think it's a three. It doesn't matter. Make it concrete, though, because you don't want to have things fall in between buttons. Um, and then what resources are you going to use to fulfill the goal, right? And sometimes, honestly, making a wrong choice in terms of bucketizing them is better than just thrashing around. You can change over time. You can call an app a low and do a low level of effort and get pushback from the stakeholders and decide, fine, next time we'll do it as a medium. Or I discovered this thing that makes this a medium, right? You're going to have to change. That stuff will, will stick. And don't, it, it's so hard to not get stuck on being, wanting to be 100% accurate. Like, I need to know all the things before I make a decision. Unfortunately, the reality is you never will. And you, get, you have to guess. You just want it to be an educated guess. Right? With some data, you can make a reasonable, educated guess. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, yes. And so I don't even remember where I saw this, but I remember someone who was trying to measure something. Maybe it was me when I was a kid. I don't even know anymore. I think, yeah, I think it was me as a kid out in the woods, but we wanted to measure something. We didn't have a yardstick or a tape measure or anything with us. So we literally just took a stick and broke it off at a length, and then it was so many sticks long. Like, that's the kind of measuring accuracy you need. This doesn't have to be super scientific, it just needs to be consistent. Um, that's really the important thing there. And you will get accuracy over time, um, and you're gonna want to optimize things all over the place. Like, oh, this, I know this takes five minutes, but if I wrote three lines of Python, it would be done in 30 seconds, well, that's great. Like, maybe think about it, but you don't have to automate all the things all the time, all at once, you can't. All right, testing. Let's talk about testing. Let's figure out what the current security state is. So you've triaged it, you know how much, when you've accepted it via the intake, you've triaged it, you know how much work you have there. Now let's go test it, right? What drives that? What are the things that generally bring stuff onto your plate? Compliance, regulation, audit. Those are just life in most businesses, they're just gonna be there. Um, I like to do proactive testing. Right, this is the kind of pre-calculation stuff I was talking about and or doing things like if I know I'm getting audited and I know what the auditors look like, a little bit ahead of time, why don't I run a test to make sure I have enough runway to fix those things so the audit goes smooth. That's just smart. I mean, that's not like rocket science or anything. Um, you can have updated code, new releases that generate these kind of tests. And then a published vulnerability a lot of times will just derail everything which is one reason why the, the calendar feature is fantastic in Defect Dojo, because at several places I worked, there was a thing that was gonna kill the world and we all had to drop everything. And I could go to the calendar and say, well, that's great, but I got Sally on this and John doing that and, you know, I don't know, so-and-so doing this other thing. And inevitably the VP would go, well, no, that Sally thing is like, that's really important too and the John thing's important. Okay, just take Henry off 
and we'll do the rest. Okay, fine. Like that, you can have those negotiations if you have data, which is one of the reasons why that single source of truth is so useful. Oh, cadence, that's a huge thing. Everybody wants to test all the things all the time in awesome automation. I love that stuff, I've done a ton of that. Um, some of my, my coolest brag things were some really neat automation that I've done, but you don't get to do that every time. So you have to think about cadence. What's the frequency which I will be testing to make sure things work out? Um, so you're gonna have some that are just gonna be based on calendar. These are the, you know, every, there's a policy that says I get audited twice a year. Well, guess what, twice a year you're gonna have to deal with the auditor. That's just, you can't do much about that. Proactive testing, I like to do this continually if you can. Sometimes you can do it as a, as a calendar-based thing, particularly if it's preemptive for those regulatory things. Um, update a new release, that really depends on the speed of your team, right? I've, I've had teams that release stuff once a year. I've had teams that release stuff 75 times a week. What's the right cadence there, right? Depends on the team. I can't tell you the universal rule. You just have to kind of get an idea of how long it takes to test and how frequently you can test them. But that, that is where it gets really interesting when you have, particularly if you're in a larger org with very different teams in terms of maturity, that can be super interesting. I worked at one place that was auto-scaling on AWS while running classic ASP apps. Like, these are not like each other. What do you do there? You just make it up. Well, you don't make it up, but you, you try to accommodate the group of, that you're having to test, but you don't have one rule to rule them all. And then publish vulnerabilities, well, that's, you just have to deal with those. They just come in and blow up your life at times. And I don't, I, I'd love to tell you there's a great way to do unplanned events. There isn't. Hopefully, if you've done some proactive testing, maybe you can reduce the work for those unplanned events, but it's just gonna happen, unfortunately. So types of testing, and I'm using SAST, or excuse me, static and dynamic very broadly speaking. Static being the thing ain't running, and um, dynamic being the thing is running, right? Because if I'm looking at a container image, to me that's really static testing, that thing isn't running. If I'm looking at a running container in a Kubernetes cluster, that is dynamic testing. So that's one of the things you're gonna have to decide what you test, and how you test it, and if your tools even cover that testing. Um, then you need to look at, from an app perspective, that running app or the source code itself. I tend to favor testing early days testing source because getting at it is easy. It's in a repo somewhere, and it's really easy to wire tools to talk to repos. So generally, the political and the operational throughput to get that done is really low. Right? Getting a decent testing environment, if you're lucky, you have it. If you're not lucky, you don't have it. Like Rackspace, it was great. We had one team. We wanted to test them. They were like, well, we're horizontally scaled for this product at, you know, for blah, blah, blah. Well, good for you. We normally do like 12 nodes, uh, horizontally scaling nodes that are auto-scaling. We'll give you a four node instance off to the side and you bang away at it all you want, right? That's fantastic. I can be as rude and ugly as I want when I'm testing that thing. There are zero customers on it, but it is an exact replica of production. That's a great test environment. Um, and then testing things in isolation and integration. This is where microservices and when I worked at Rack with the cloud and all the pieces of the cloud that talk to each other get really, really complex. And right? if you have two things launching at the same time that have interdependencies on each other, the timing of when those make it into a test environment can really change your ability to test them accurately. These are like weird, complex things that can bubble up in your life that you have to think about. Um, if you're lucky, like Rack, we ended up doing a lot of little clouds to give us the ability to have sort of isolated tests, but then you don't know if there's problems with the interaction of those two systems, right? There's trade-offs, so you gotta think about those things. They're just kind of tricky. Um, oh, yeah, and I already said that. Microservices and Kubernetes make things even more exciting and interesting and complicated, like Jim said a minute ago. So how far left can you go? And uh, Jeff Williams, I'll give him credit for this, said if when you shift left, you're just one F letter away from doing something else to the left. I'll let you do the uh, alphabetic math. So I, I'd be, I, I love the idea of shifting left, and I think the idea of testing early is a great thing, but you can't always test early, right? I cannot test the interaction of two microservices while the developers are coding them up. They don't even bloody exist, potentially. Or at least those versions aren't launched in production. 
I can't test that. I can't shift that left. Integration and those kind of testings are just not possible. Um, so pick your battles, get feedback loops. Like for me, the thing with left testing is I really want to do left testing if I can get a feedback loop to the developer quickly. If I do a far left test and they don't hear about it until it rolls out to production, that was a wasted effort, absolutely wasted effort. So if you don't have good feedback loops or a way to get back to the dev teams, I don't know that left testing is all that useful, to be really honest with you. That's where you get the benefit. Right? 10 minutes after the guy checked in code, he get a ding on Slack and says, hey, there's a vulnerability here. That's huge. Right? If you can't do that, might not be worth it. It kind of depends. Um, I said that, I said that. Yeah, that's what all those things. OK, perfect. Oh, and then CICD. So CICD, I've done tons of this. It's a very good thing. I would recommend trying to do as much of this as possible. But if you're breaking builds in CICD, you need to treat false positives like anaphylactic shock. Like you do not want those. Or if you want to get kicked out of CICD instantly, break a build for something that isn't actionable, right? That is the recipe to be ushered out the door. So be really careful with your testing. Pick things you know. What I like to do is run things kind of on the side quietly three or four times to understand what the tool output gives me and then wire it in, because then I know. I've seen a couple of weird edge cases that pop up, and I can code around those or make exceptions or whatever I need to do, but it doesn't break the build for something that isn't actionable. And I see a lot of people getting caught up in not understanding the difference between what I would call a health check and a full scan. Like, yes, I cannot check all the things in a CICD job generally, but if I can check 20% of the things, I'm 20% ahead. Why wouldn't I do that? Right? So, don't think that you have to do these full-blown check all the things in CICD necessarily if you can whittle them down to something that runs quicker. Because the other way to get kicked out of CICD is make it take a day instead of 20 minutes, right? That's another way to get asked off the door. Um, oh, if you want to get Ninja, this is a great one. Um, and this is really for very mature teams or if you have a decent amount of uh, people bandwidth, so to speak. Um, if you want to get Ninja, you do retesting. And what I mean by this is you find an issue, you create a test that exercises that issue, and you put it in CICD, and it's red until it's fixed, and it goes green. I've seen this happen with a friend of mine who did this where he was working, and he was able to tell the developers, by the way, that last release you pushed out fixed this issue. And they were like, oh, it did? Yeah, yeah, it did. That's kind of cool. Oh, and then long running versus uh, quick tests. If you do wire in something that takes longer, that's OK. Just make it non-build breaking, right? It's, gonna, it's basically going to kick off a scan and then go green and let the scan run. And then you just have to have the intelligence in that job to no op until that initial scan is complete. That Rackspace team, 75 deploys a week, we did this all the time. We could not move as fast as them. None of our tools could, right? And that's OK as long as I can no op until the test runs again. Because I'd rather run it three times in a week than just give up even though they're, they're releasing God knows how many between those three times. OK, said all that stuff. Cool. Delivery, the last one. Um, so how do you address your downstream ones? And, and honestly, I, I don't have enough time, but it was hilarious or very enlightening or I was happy to hear what was said in the keynote yesterday because that's all about delivery. She was all about delivery, Shannon was, right? So you have to understand where your mandate, where your reporting stops, right? Are you just reporting? Are you doing remediation? Are you doing retesting? That'll obviously change how you do delivery. Um, and then you need to speak, and this is what Shannon said yesterday, you need to speak in the native tongue of the person you're talking to. She went to a, a, a C, or CIO and she brought numbers, right? That's what you need to do. Um, issue trackers, obviously, for devs. I don't know anybody, is anybody going to argue me about not giving PDFs to developers? Like, who would argue that? That's awful. I used to be a developer. I hated those things. They're stupid. But an issue in my issue tracker, I get what that is. For VPs above, you're going to have to do summary data and charts. If you can do dashboards for greater visibility, that kind of depends on politically how things are. At Rackspace, it was really big for teams to put up these public large screen dashboards to say, hey, look at the cool stuff we're doing. If you can get away with that, that's a great thing. It's like a very visible display of value to everybody that walks around if you are in a, in a physical building. Um, and then engaging pride. This is probably one of the 
the best things I ever kind of accidentally learned. There was an issue that crossed multiple teams when I was working at Rackspace. And I talked to one of the teams and, you know, hey, you have this issue, you need to fix it. We talked through how they were going to do it. Okay, they're going to fix it. Great. Went to this other team and they're giving me serious pushback. I know we can't, there's no way. With this timeline and no, 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 no not happening, not happening, not happening. Okay, what do we do? So I said to them, well, gosh, if you guys are having this hard of a time getting it fixed, you know, this other team, they got it fixed really quick. Do you want me to bring them in? And maybe they can give you some, you know, help you, consult with you, give you some advice. And obviously they were like, we don't need the help of that other team. <laughs> oh, hell no, we can do it. They did it in a week, we'll do it in four days. No, oh, three, we'll do it in three. Like, they just got all up in the, they were, it was hilarious. Pride is a useful lever, use it if you can, right? Um, it's kind of sneaky and underhanded, but it got the thing fixed, which made me happy. Okay, let's get to the conclusion wrap all the things up. So you need to understand your environment and scope. That is absolutely crucial. That's gonna affect the rest of the decisions you make. You need to create a workflow. I really like the idea of an AppSec pipeline. The other thing that gives you, by the way, that I failed to mention, is you understand where things are. Right? If you have concrete steps of like, this is an intake. This is a level two project that's gonna run these four tools against it. It makes things really clear. Um, Constant iteration, I can't tell you enough. You never have a system that works right. The first time I ever did my first AppSec pipeline, I kind of went stealth for a month, and we launched like V01 of it, I would say, and then we just continually made it better. Right? You're never gonna have it perfect. Just plan on iterating, because you're gonna find out new things, things are gonna change, you're gonna have to adjust. So the feedback loops are crucial. Um, and let the system tell you, don't tell the system. And what I mean is, as you're running this AppSec pipeline or whatever your program is, you need to listen to the feedback from what you're doing, not dictate what it should do. Um, and people in time are gonna be your critical resource. You will never have enough people in time. So if you're automating anything, automating the stupid, no human brain things. One, your people will be far happier because they're not doing stupid, no human brain things. And two, you get your people using their brains for the stuff that only they can do. So there's a lot of dumb rote things you can take out of your team's life if you pick your automation battles correctly. So we talked about the six uh, simple machines of DevOps, those two fundamental truths and four what's, right? So ground truth and the uh, single source of truth and then intake, right? What work comes in and how does that fit into your scope? Triage, how much resources am I going to give to achieve the goal? Test, what is the current state of that thing that I'm testing, my testing target? And deliver, what do I need to do now that I've done this testing to show value to the company that's hiring me and making paying my bills? So hopefully I've helped you turn chaos into calm and distress into success. This has worked for me. Honestly, one time it worked too well. I was actually getting pushbacks from other parts of the security team saying, hey, stop, you're making us look bad. And I was frankly not very sympathetic to that. I kind of thought, well, up your game, dude, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> like I'm, you know, I don't know what to tell you, work harder. It's not a you know, political thing to say, but heck, that's what it was. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm.